when you press that button. So when the backup starts, what's happening to your what's happening to your files, what's happening to your folders, where are they going and what are they doing? Um this obviously is a is a backup software. Uh, it's not as exciting. It's not probably for anybody who probably thought this would be similar to Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Unfortunately, <laughs> uh, the web backup business isn't as uh, as exciting as uh, the the Chocolate Factory. Um, but we will look at the kind of things that are on in the background. Um, there are no umpa lumpas that magically take the files away or anything like that. But we will look at some of the, the the details around what actually happens in the back end when you're running your backup. Okay. So, to get started, um, just a quick introduction of myself. My own name is Niall Fahey. For anybody who hasn't uh, attended one of our webinars before, I look after the internal and external training uh, and learning and development for the MOSI organization. So, we do these webinars once a month. Generally, it's the last Wednesday of each month that we run these webinars. And what they're normally broken down into is a brief slide deck presentation like we'll go through here now. Normally I would go through a demonstration of depending on what the topic is in terms of what we're talking about. With today's topic, obviously it would be more heavily weighted towards the slide deck presentation and then the question and answers at the end. Okay, so in the question and answer section, I will answer as many questions as I can in relation to the topic that we're discussing today. If you do have any questions as we're going through, please do pop them in as well to the to the um, question box and I will answer them as we get to them uh, in the question and answer session or if I think it's relevant as I'm going through, I'll keep an eye on them and I'll, I'll, I'll answer them as we're going through as well. Okay, so that's the rough kind of breakdown of what the session will be. Today's session, as we said, is going to look at the backup process and what happens after you press the start button. First, we're going to just have a quick look at the, the architecture to identify the parts we're talking about. Then we're going to look at the backup process, which is the main part of the session. And then we're just going to quickly look at behind the cloud in terms of the what it looks like on our back end when you press that start button and the, and the files get up there. And then what happens in terms of files that are changing? So what does that look like on our back end? Okay. So here's a very generalized and quick over overview view of our architecture. So you'll see there are four parts here. So what we have, the first one we have on the left hand side here is the admin console. Okay, so that's our administration aspect of things. So when we're talking about the admin console, we're talking about authentication and secure sign-in. But also it's an area where we look after the client configurations. So for the Umozi Pro users on the webinar, if you set up a client configuration to push out to all your users, then this is the area of our architecture where that configuration is stored. Okay, so... The admin console is one aspect. It's where we do authentication for all of our accounts. Even when you're running a backup, this is where your 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 backup goes to authenticate to say, okay, well, this is the right person and so forth. Then we have a split up into two other sections. So we have the client side, which is the front end, and we have the server side, which is our back end. Okay, and then we have this little restore web access area here as well, which again accesses all points. So the client front end is when we talk about the backup software, so be it a Windows or Mac installation, if you're using the Mosey Sync software, or if you're using the Restore Manager. These are all things that run on your, your computer, so the front end of our system. It's the, it's the place that you interact with on, on your daily basis with the Mosey software. The back end side of things then is our servers. This is where we interact and we, we would monitor and and identify any issues from this side of things on, on our on our end. Um, but it's the back end part of the software that you see on your machine. So here we have the data servers, we have the, the storage, and we also have our manifest servers. And our manifest servers basically 
what our manifest servers do is they they take note of where your files are so what files are you backing up to the software when were they backed up when were they changed where they're located on our servers so the manifest server it tracks everything and i like to think of it exactly the same as a manifest on a ship whereby you would have a listing of everything that comes on the ship everything goes off the ship dates and times of those things happening and as well as that where they're located on the ship and it's the same for your files you would have a manifest on our, our on our back end and you also have a manifest that resides on your computer and that just basically when we're running a backup we match those two together so that we can put the data in the appropriate places and identify which files are actually there already so that's just a quick high level glance at what our architecture looks like and it's those four parts that make up our entire architecture so moving on into the backup process okay so this is the real part of the session we want to talk about so our backup process is a nine step process okay or rather that's how i like to see it broken up into so the first step there you see on this on the page is the connection and authentication and that's the first thing that's done off the bat. So when you press the start button or you have an automatic starting of your backup, what happens there is obviously the connection is opened. It's open to our back end. It's open through if you have a firewall on your computer. It's opened out through the connection for that into the Mosey servers. So the connection is opened. But that's not a, a connection that we're ready to start transferring files on or anything like that because we have yet to authenticate. So the authentication then occurs at that step as well. So the client authenticates itself. It presents its password and it presents its username. So that's your email address and the password that you would have selected. In that process, then we're able to take from our authentication server and say, okay, well, this user, it's correct. This is the correct uh, username. This is the correct password. This is the correct machine ID that we have listed for this, 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 this account and it will take the backup. So that now is the connection is opened, it's authenticated, and we're ready to start the serious backup process. We do, the next step then is configuration and updates. So straight away, what the software will do is, after it's just opened the connection and, and it's done the authentication, it will check for any updates to the software from our server side. So if there is a newer version of the software being pushed out, it checks for that. It checks that if there's a new version available and it will it will it will it will notify you then once the backup completes that there's a newer version available or if it's a if it's a version of the software that we're force implementing say it's a it's a fix to an issue and we're pushing it out as a replacement to the current version then it will automatically be downloaded and it will install once the backup is completed the same with the configuration the configuration is to identify if you're a Mosey Pro user, if you've created a configuration for your for a lot of your users from the admin console, then it's at this point that the software actually pulls that down. So again, it pulls that configuration down at the start of the backup, the same with the update, but they don't get applied until after the backup is finished. Because obviously we don't want a scenario where you're trying to run a backup and we're trying to install a new version of the software or we're trying to pull down a new configuration. We'll pull them down there, but we don't implement them until the backup is finished because obviously the backup is the most important part of this connection. The next step we take then, okay, so we're authenticated. We know we're running the latest version of software. There's no configuration updates. The next thing then was we look at the changes, okay? And we call it, we, this is termed parsing changes. And I've just created a little diagram here to, to show you what that's about. Okay, so the Mosey file filter is installed on your machine, on a Windows machine. In the Mac client, we tap into Finder. And what that does then is it just monitors the, the machine and the files and the folders that you've selected for backup. It doesn't monitor the entire machine. It just monitors, that filter is only monitoring the files and folders that you've selected. I've simplified this down really uh, quite a bit because there is other databases that feed into this filter file, giving it the list of files of what of the files to monitor from the files that have been selected from your backup. 
but for all intents and purposes, what it's doing is it's monitoring your computer for the files and folders that you've selected. Okay? If you make changes to a file, or you add a new file to locations uh, that you have selected for backup, this uh, file filter picks that up and it pushes the changes to our changes database. So this changes database is on your machine. Okay, so it's, it's part of one of the MOSI uh, files that's within the MOSI folder when it's installed on your machine. And within this changes database, then we take note of these changes. So it can be a new file, it could be a deleted file, it could be a file that's just changed. And then when you hit the start button, so when the start button is, is happening then, it's actually this, this um, changes database that we're, we're referencing. So when we're parsing the changes, we're checking this changes database. And this database then is the one that we take the file, we take notification of what files need to be backed up, and we push them out to the cloud. So rather than going through the process when the backup starts and having to look at, okay, well, we better scan the file system and see which files and folders have changed since the last backup, or let's see which files have been added. This has been done on an ongoing basis in the background so that once the backup uh, comes about, that we can actually start the backup and complete the backup a lot faster and use a lot less resources when the backup is running on your end. Okay, so that's really what's happening when we're talking about parsing the changes. We're looking during the day-to-day the -day runnings of the machine, the file filter is monitoring those areas that you've selected for backup and those files and folders that you've selected for backup. If there's any changes or additions or deletions, it notifies the change database, which takes a recording of that. And then once the backup kicks off, we can reference that changes database and quickly identify which files need to be backed up, which files need to be removed, and which files need to be updated. So we've now parsed our changes. We've identified the files and folders that are going to be backed up. We've identified the files and folders that need to be removed and so forth. The next thing we need to do is encrypt the data to make it safe, okay? So this encryption here that's implemented is actually the encryption that you choose when you're installing. So it's either the default encryption key, which is the 448-bit Blowfish encryption, or the 256-bit advanced encryption standard, which is our custom encryption key. So at this point here, that's what's happening. We're taking the encryption we've chosen and we're implementing it onto the files that are to be backed up. So we're encrypting those files, getting them ready for transfer. And it's important to note this encryption here is the encryption that will be on the file when it sits at rest on our servers. Okay, so that data then is, is taken, it's encrypted, and it's pushed out to our servers. During the data transfer period then, which is step five, this is when we're taking the data from your computer, passing it through the internet, and out into our servers or into the MOSI cloud. At this point, that connection that's made between your machine and the MOSI servers is also encrypted. It's encrypted, it's a HTTPS encryption. So that's an SSL encryption. So that is kind of very similar to for anybody who's familiar with purchasing anything online or doing online banking, you'll always notice in the address bar, you'll have a HTTPS. And that's just a secure, let's say identify a secure connection. And a connection that's encrypted as well. So during the transfer period, not only is the tunnel or the pipeline that you're sending the data over the, the, the internet to our servers on encrypted, but the data itself then has also been encrypted by your choosing with the default or the custom. That's why you might sometimes see in some of the documentation online, or you may hear from uh, for some of the Mosi Pro customers, they may have remembered one of the sales reps telling them about how the data is double encrypted on transfer, and that's where it comes from. Okay, so once the data then gets to our server side, that obviously SSL connection is gone, and it just remains the encryption that they've chosen to store this, the files on our servers with. So that's either your, your default or custom encryption. So we've gone through our first five steps and now the data is at our servers. So the next thing we wanna do and the next thing the Mosi service does is it encodes the data. So 
very similar to when you're saving a file to your hard drive. So if, you, if you're working on a, a Word document today and you hit the save button, when it gets saved to the hard drive, it doesn't get saved as one big file. It's not like when you take a file and put it into a filing cabinet. When you're saving to a hard drive, it gets split up. And that's, um, for a lot of people, because they use a spinning hard disk drive, so not to go too, too deep into it, but for most people on their machines, they're using uh, spinning hard disk drives. And that just, if you know an old record player, and the way the record goes round and the music is read, it's the same with some hard drives. They have a spinning disc, and that just means that the writes are happening in different parts of the disc. So rather than taking a file and putting it into a filing cabinet, imagine that what's happening is that that single file has been torn into into nine individual pieces and stored in different in different parts of that filing cabinet. And then when you want that file. We're taking all those individual parts out of that file and cabinet and putting them back together. That's what happens on your normal hard drive, okay? When we do an encoding process on our servers, we go an additional step further. So normally your file would be broken up into nine pieces when saving it locally. What happens with the MOSI process is we'll take that Word document, we push it through our encoding process, and we'll break the file up into 12 pieces, okay? And what happens there is that nine of these pieces are the original file and three of these pieces are what we call parity pieces. Okay. And they just contain enough information about the entire file to be able for to allow us to be able to recreate the file should anything happen to any uh, one or two pieces of the file. So when the data is pushed to our to our to the to our servers. We don't store it in one in one area. So again, we're not taking the Word document that you send us and saving it in on one drive. Okay. So within the Mosey Cloud, we obviously have multiple servers within within when our when our when our, when our data centers. And what happens here is that each one of these pieces is sent to a different server within the same data center. Okay, so the encoding process, when it's when it's submitting the files to the servers, what it tries to do is it breaks it up obviously into the 12 pieces, and then it spreads it up across the different servers within the data center. And again, that's all for reliability. It's all to allow us to be able to restore your file should anything happen. And it's also to ensure that no part of the file is, stir is stored on the same hard drive. Because at the end of the day, all these servers are, is just, hundreds and hundreds of hard drives. So we split up that file, we store it across all of our servers, and then it's stored there safely and securely for you should you need to restore the file. So once we have the encoding process finished, we've gotten to a stage now where we have the files have been transferred to our, our machine, or to our servers, we've encoded them, We've we've broken them up and we've we've pushed them. We're getting ready to push them out into into and submit them to the individual hard drives and the multiple servers. What we do next is just to check some verification, and all this is is just before we say okay, we're confirming the submission of these files to our servers. Is we're just going to check that what we have on our servers right now is the same as to what you sent up from your computer. So obviously, we don't want a scenario where you sent us up a word, word, a word document, and we're getting we're getting the word document up, but it's ninety percent different to the file that you sent up to us. We obviously don't want to submit that to our servers because it's not a true image of what you sent to us. So basically, for all intents and purposes, this is just like a checklist you might create create when you're going on vacation to make sure that you have everything that you laid out on the bed put into the suitcase. So that's all that's happening there is we're just confirming, okay, what I said I was backing up, this is this is what you have now on the servers is exactly matching that. Now you can submit it to the servers. And then we submit it out and we confirm the submission onto the individual hard drives in our data centers. The second last step then is just our logging process. So 
throughout the throughout the backup process, the manifest server that I mentioned a while ago, which takes track and it's taking note of where the so where each part of the file. So when we went through the encoding process, where each part where where, where each of those twelve pieces of that file, where they've gone to, what server they're gone onto, what particular hard drive they're gone onto, then it's taking note of all that to manifest and it's logging all that. Okay. We then make sure that the manifest that we're that is is we have connected to that's on your computer mirrors the same data. And then we sign off those and close down those manifests because they've completed their function. And then we also update upload the load the latest log file from your computer. So the latest log file of uh, from the backup software on your machine is then uploaded at this stage as well. Once that has been done, once we're happy that everything has been recorded and logged properly, we then disconnect the connection. And this is then when you get your message to say backup completed successfully. So that in a very quick and concise nine step process is what's actually happening when you hit that start button. So it's not just, you know, obviously it runs in the background sometimes and you may not pay much attention to it, but this is what's actually happening. These are the kind of the steps. Um, and I've oversimplified a lot of them whereby I'm showing them as happening in one step after another. But oftentimes a lot of these steps are happening um, at the same time. They're happening concurrently. You know, the encryption process could be happening on one file while another file is being encoded on our, on our server side. So that's what's actually happening um, in those in those scenarios. So so there's a good question there, actually, just uh, I'm going to reference it just here before I finish up this backup process piece. And it's just around open files and particularly SQL database files. Are they backed up? Yes. Uh, so what we would use there for open files, if a user is, let's take, for example, my scenario. Um, if I was creating this PowerPoint today and we would say I run my backup and I'm, I'm creating this PowerPoint, my backup is running in the background. Because this file is opened, you might say, okay, well, what's going to happen there? What actually happens is Mosey uses the VSS service to take a snapshot of the open file and then it's, that's what we back up for the backup process is the snapshot of that file in terms of sqlite databases it's the same thing we use specific vss backup sets so these are not backup sets that mosey creates rather they're backup sets that are created with with the presence of a sql database or exchange or something like that vss will have specific writers installed on the machine and when we do the scan and the install of the software, we'll pick up these VSS backup sets and we'll offer them to you to run backups. And then it just it just what it allows us to do is it allows you it allows you as a user to leave open your SQL database files and obviously your exchange files, and yet they still be backed up. You know, because obviously it would be a major issue if we said to a customer, okay, well, you know. Now you want to back up your exchange for your 500 users in your office. Could you just tell everybody to log off the exchange server so that we can shut it down so we can run a backup? That wouldn't be a great thing to say. So to avoid that and give the users a better, uh, I suppose, a better service, we use VSS to back up open files. So it allows users to work away on their SQL, it allows users to work away on their Word documents and so forth. And yet we can still pick up those files for backup. Okay, so just moving on to the the second last. So moving on to the second last um, slides here is just looking at the behind the cloud instance. Okay, so in terms of the backup process, as I say, I've over I've probably oversimplified it in the nine steps. A lot of them happen concurrently together, um, but that's just to give you a rough idea of what's actually happening. So. Moving on to this, as I say here, so behind the cloud, what we're looking at there is that when you're running a backup, so I went through the backup steps there, okay? So let's visualize that. Let's take it for what's happening here again is the nine step process, okay? The first step is we're hitting that authentication server, okay? We're identifying, okay, 
if this machine can be backed up or not. Okay, and then what we're doing then is we're contacting the relevant data, uh, the data, relevant data center. Okay, so if you say, for example, I'm on I'm on server one or data center one, when I connect to that data center, what's happening there then is that depending on the time of backup and whatever and whatever may be, is that the the load balancer that's situated there will identify where it wants to push me to. Okay, so not every backup, not every backup that you do would point towards the same server every time. As I mentioned a while ago, we try and spread out the files across multiple servers within our data center to avoid any, you know, any, avoid any scenarios where the files are being backed up on the same, on the same um, hardware. So we spread it out as much as possible, and we do that by when you're connecting every time. We'll see which is the fastest server at that point and point it towards that server. And this happens for every file that's been passed up. So every time the a file has been passed up, it's been pointed towards the fastest server at that time to ensure the file gets up there as quick as possible. And we're getting it around there um, and making sure that it's it's spread out and it's 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 in a in a in a fault uh, or sorry in a, <clears throat> in a failure tolerant way. Okay. So that's what we're able. We're, that's what we do in terms of behind the cloud. So once it's authenticated and you're pushing towards the servers, and the whole uh, backup process, it's what's happening there. In terms of changes to a file, okay. So when you make a change to a file, so Mosey is an incremental service. So that means that when you run your initial backup, you if you remember back to when you ran your initial backup, when you ran your first backup. It normally is the longest backup that you run because every file has to be backed up in its entirety. Okay, so you back up everything in full. And then the next backup that occurs, we back up the change. Okay, so in this example here, we see that the, the face.png was created on the 1st of January in 2014. So that's my initial backup of the file. Okay, on the 5th of January, I make a change and that becomes patch one or change one. Okay, and that's recorded on our servers. On the 7th, I make additional changes and that becomes patch two or change two. Okay, and this is updated into my servers. So when we talk about versions, if sometimes you, if you've been, if you've contacted support before and they've mentioned a version of a file or so forth, this is what's actually happening. If you take, for example, the January 5th, okay, if I was to go and access that file and I wanted to restore that file, I would actually have to restore patch one and face.png because that makes up the full file on January the 5th. Similarly, if I was to go and try and uh, restore the file from January the 7th, I would have to restore patch two, patch one, and face.png. OK, because the patch one and patch two are the different versions. They're the changes that were made to the file. So they're a the different version of the file. So when we're talking about changes, this is what's actually happening. We're backing up the baseline file and then we're backing up the changes on an ongoing basis. So that's what allows you when you go in and you select the when you're doing a restore and you go into the calendar and you go back. That's what's allowing you to do that is those different versions that we store. OK, so that is, brings us to the end. I'm just conscious we're at the bottom of the hour. Um, that brings the end to my presentation. I'm going to start in answering the questions that have been posted. Um, I answered Paul's question in terms of the open files. Just let me know, Paul, if that answer was OK for you. Um, if not, we can revisit it. Uh, if anybody else has any other, any other questions, pop them in. I'm going to start going through the questions that we have so far. Okay. So Jolene, a uh, question, if you can download your files by folder. So yeah, you can. I mean, if you have, if you've done, let's say a web restore, um, if you've gone in there and you've selected the folder for restore, um, then yes, when you download that file, 
it will it will contain those files within the folder. However, if you've gone into a folder and you've restored files using Web Restore, then it's just going to restore those individual files. Now, it's slightly different when you do it if you do a restore from within the software that's installed on your machine. If you do an inclined restore from there, okay, if you select a file, then it restores that file in its folder structure. So no matter what the folder structure was, if you select one individual file from it when you're doing a restore from an inclined, it'll actually restore that in this entire folder structure. And as I said a second ago, it's slightly different when you do it on the web. If you if you select an individual file to restore on the web from within a folder, let's say for example, it will only restore that individual file because that's the one you've requested. If you want to, if you're doing a web restore and you want the folder also, select the folder. And if there's a couple of files that you don't want inside there, then deselect them. And um, that's probably about the only way that you would get the scenario where you still have the folder structure as well as the files that are within it. It's just a design feature that if you do select from the web-based application, that if you do select individual files within a folder, we don't tend to restore the entire file structure. Um, and that's just to make the restore smaller. Um, and it's to make it restore faster for you. Um, and not restore a file structure that you may not necessarily want. Okay, just let me know if that answers your question, Jolene. So, Ivan, has Moza ever been successfully hacked since this session? No, um, I can honestly say we haven't. Um, and Mosey, as well as uh, another reason, I suppose, from, from a Mosey perspective, Mosey is a non compute backend. So, it's the same if you know if if um for example if if you're if you were to accidentally uh, get a virus on your machine that if you backed up that file that has the virus on it into mosi servers it wouldn't pass the virus into the mosi servers because it's a non compute background so no, there's nothing execute. It's a non, it doesn't execute any programs in the back end. So that virus can't actually spread out on our servers. So you know that's another thing just to to take note of that. You know, if you were to accidentally uh, get a virus on your machine, then you can restore older versions of your files from Mosey um, back. So when if you roll back your machine, that you can actually access those files um, for restore. Okay. Um, Ivan has another question. So, is Mosey able to back up a Word document that is password protected? Yeah, there should be no issue if there's if the file is password protected. There should be no issue with Mosey backing that up. Um, it would just treat it as another file because we're not actually looking to open the file itself. Um, it shouldn't be an issue with backing up a uh, password protected file. Okay, Ivan. Hi Deborah. Yeah, I do record this the the sessions. So what I normally will do is I will send this on to our um, community team, and they'll upload it onto our our community forums. And once it's up there, I'll get the link off them, and I'll email it out to everybody who's registered for today. Okay, so that'll give you the chance to go back and listen to it, um, and. If possibly if I've been speaking a bit too fast at times when I get excited, um, you might be able to slow it down a bit or re-listen re to it once or twice more. I do apologize. Eric, so yeah, so we only, when, we, when we're doing incremental backups, we're only backing up incrementally the individual files. So, we're looking at we're backing up files and folders. We're not backing up the entire file. We're not backing up your entire operating system. So when we do a, a backup, when we're talking about incremental backups, if you see the image on the screen, what I'm talking about there is is exactly what you're seeing here is the face.png was your initial backup, and the incremental backup then is these individual patches. So it's those changes. So we we back up those changes to the file. Okay, and then when you're when you're taking the January fifth file, and you want to restore that file, you're having to restore the original face.png file as well as the patch one, and those combined are the entire file together. Okay, 
So you couldn't, like, for example, if you go to restore from January the 5th, you're not just restoring the patch one because that wouldn't be that wouldn't give you the full file it will only it will only add to the changes that happened to the original file Yes, uh, so Paul, um, Paul, great question. Can the encryption type be set in the non-pro version of Mosey? It can when you do the installation of the software. Um, just after you get to the summary screen, in the bottom left-hand corner, there'll be an option there. It'll be a blue hyperlink, and it'll be an option to change your encryption. Now, there is a word of warning that if you are using custom, if you are using the custom encryption key, that you need to keep that encryption key safe and secure and somewhere that's not on your machine that you're backing up because if you lose that there's no way for us to be able to you know we can restore your files to you but they'll be encrypted and if you don't have that encryption key obviously we're, you're not going to be able to unencrypt them um, and there won't be anything we'll be able to do in that scenario so it is very important that if you are choosing the custom encryption key that you keep that very safe um, we would recommend people to, you know, obviously with the default encryption key, the advantage is that the file is encrypted on our end and it's, it's able to be restored to you in an unencrypted fashion that it's ready to use when it's, once you get, once it's downloaded onto your machine. <clears throat> um, and there's less chance of it being lost. If it's an issue where you're worried about access to the file, nobody can access your files online without you knowing. Um, so nobody from within Mosey can access anybody's files without the user knowing. And even at that, the only thing that I can see uh, when I open up a restore window is the file names. I can't see anything within the files. To do that, I'd actually actually have to restore the files myself. And to do that would notify the user that files have been restored. And there would be a, 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 a trail on that um, as to where these things have happened. So there is, it's, it is still very secure if you're using the default encryption, but if you do choose to use the custom encryption for that extra bit of security, just be very careful where you store that custom encryption key um, so that when you need to do restores that you have access to it because it is very important. Uh, Deborah, so... Good question. Um, so how long would it take for 500 gigabytes of files to restore to a computer? Um, so this is in this, uh, you know, this is a very varying question. Uh, or sorry, my answer would be very varying in the sense that it's it's not something that I could give a, de a definitive time to. It's, it's like uh, how long a piece of string is. You know, it'll all depend on the bandwidth that's available and the speed of your internet provider. So, you know, for some, for some people with very good broadband, that might be, you know, that could be maybe a day or two, maybe a couple of hours if you had extremely good broadband, um, to couple, a couple, up to a couple of days if you had a particularly slow broadband connection or a slow internet connection. Um, it, it, it would entirely depend on, on how good that connection is from, from, from your end. So I couldn't say with it with any any level of uh, of, of uh, definition. I'm sure there's probably a couple of websites online that you could probably find out how long it would take you by you know by inputting some information in terms of 500 gigabytes, um, but none that I'm 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 aware of to give you a definitive answer. Sorry about that, Deborah. So Jim, so. Joe, Joe, I, I'm apologies if I'm butchering the pronunciation of your name. Um, could Mosey restore the face.png if you want to see what you created? Yeah, entirely, of course. Yeah, so if you wanted to, um, within reason, obviously. Um, if 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 today is only the tenth of January, I could go back and restore um, the first of January. I could restore that only face.png, the original creation of the file. Okay, but. If, say, for example, I'm a, I'm a Mosey Home customer and my retention is only 30 days and today is the 5th of March, 
I couldn't actually go back to the 1st of January and restore that particular, just to face that PNG. I wouldn't have the ability to restore that particular version from the 1st of January. So it would depend on how far out you are from the original file being uploaded in terms of seeing what the initial file was. I hope that answers your question. And again, apologies if I if 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 I miss well, I'm probably gonna guess that I did mispronounce your name and I do apologize. So Gilles, so you restored your files to new computers and the files weren't restored to the same place. Um, and you gave an example that some of your 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 picture files were not restored to pictures. This is entirely possible. And um, if you've restored from the web, um, it won't actually restore back into the default location. Um, it will restore to the location of your choosing. What it will do is most of the time is that if you have restored all your files, and um, what it will do is you'll find that the the files are put into folders, Im imitating the folder structure that was there previously. And unfortunately, that does mean then that you would have to manually go in and put them back into the locations that you wanted. Um, it's um, if you were to use the incline software, um, so if you were to use the software that's installed in your machine to run a restore, then you could choose the option to restore directly back into the location that they were backed up from. There is one um, thing I would say about doing the the restore from within the software. Um, we would kind of recommend um, that you wouldn't do any restores larger than four gigabytes from the software that's installed on the machine. And the only reason that is, is that while that restore is running, you're not going to be able to run a backup. And that's the only reason. And I suppose, like, I mean, if you had faster internet connection, then, you know, that could be, you could probably stretch that up to eight or 10 gigabytes um, in the same time frame. But it's it's more it's not so much a hard limit or anything like that it's more so kind of a guideline it's just the fact that while if you're using the software that's installed in your machine to run a restore while that restore is running you won't be able to run a backup at the same time but if it's something that you wanted to do a restore in your instance where you want to restore the files back into their default location so where they were backed up from your in-client backup is uh, or the in-client software um, using the incline restore option would probably be your best bet there. Otherwise, if you use the web restore interface, what's going to happen is that you're going to download it to a particular location, and in that location, it's just going to be in. So, probably most likely, some of those JPEG files were inside a folder called pictures. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Gilles. Um, let me know if it doesn't. Okay, sorry, sorry, Jolene. Uh, so you've restored to a new computer. Okay, so in that instance, yeah, it's most likely going to restore uh, the files to you um, just as as files within 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 the restores. Um, using if if you've used the restore manager, um, if just let me know if, if it's if it's the restore manager you've used. If that's the case, then it will restore them into the location of your choosing. Um, but it still should have. It still should have um, restored the folders. If the files, if a group of files were inside a particular folder, then it should have restored the folder structure. Um, if it hasn't, then let me know, um, and we can take this offline, um, and I'll get somebody to 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 set up a remote session with you and have a look at that issue. I hope that. Uh, so, and the second time of going, uh, Jolene, that that answers uh, answers your question in, in part. In part. So, Paul, um, yeah. So the question, your 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 one there is sometimes the log states files already on most of servers, even though it is this first time it's backed up. So it may be that you had if the file had maybe been been backed up previously, um, and then was deselected for backup. Or if the file was, if the file was selected in a different location previously and was backed up, 
and then that would show us file already on Mosey servers. There is another scenario whereby if you have, um, so we use single instance storage. So what's the best way to, so let's say for example, um, I have the movie um, Planes, Trains and Automobiles and I have a copy of that file and I back it up to our servers. You also have a copy of, of Planes, Trains and Automobiles and we've both downloaded it from iTunes, okay? That file is going to have the same hash number and that's what we use to identify the files, whether it's on my computer or on your computer. And what that means then is if I back it up, what we'll do is we'll back it up the one time and what we will do then is that for both of us then we'll point where what well, both of us then will have will be will have access to that file. So we'll both be able to restore it. Because it's the same file in necessity for both of us, there would be no point in putting your machine if I've already taken the time to back it up from my computer, what will the software will do is say, well, there's no point in there's no point in us asking Paul's computer to back up this file, let's say it's let's say it's a gig for argument's sake. That there's no point in asking Paul's computer to back up back up this file that's a gig in size. Um, this movie file because we already have it on our servers what we'll do is we'll just point to his manifest to this file and he'll be able to download that 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 um movie and that's what will happen sometimes um in some scenarios where you see file already on mosey servers it could be because it's a universal file that has the same hash algorithm as another file that that, that you know maybe i've backed up um but it's that would only generally kind of happens most of the time with some things like movie files and music files that are kind of, um, I suppose, they're not unique files to, to, to an individual. They're files that nearly everybody might have, but they're, you know, multiple copies of them downloaded across multiple areas. I hope that answers the question, Bob. So Eric, um, good question. Um, the thing about it is that with picture files, generally they don't change. Um, so yeah, there would be, you know, in the scenario where, so, um, so sorry for everybody, the, the question is, so the patches are not the complete file. No, they're just the changes. Um, doesn't that mean you'd have to understand the structure of every file type that anyone would back up? A PNG, for example, is a bunch of numer numerical gobbledygook. Um, how can you only back up part of that and reassemble the complete file? So there in, in that scenario, like a PNG file, a picture file generally doesn't. I know I've used it here in my example and it probably wasn't the uh, the greatest uh, thought process I went through. <laughs> but, you know, generally picture files would not change. Um, you know, um, generally picture files don't change. And if if they do um you know in, in in this in this instance i mean if it was a scenario where you were changing them like that yeah we would have to understand this the structure of the file type um, and that's why we don't back up absolutely every single file type that we'd have so that every single file type that's out there is not necessarily mean that we can back up absolutely everything and um, there are probably some softwares that we don't know about um and you know we probably probably would would, would have have issue backing up but for most run-of-the-mill stuff that everybody has on their machines, the likes of these types of uh, picture files, types of Word documents and all that kind of stuff, we would have no issue um, backing up. Um, but yeah, that is a good point. It is not, the patches are not the complete file, they are just the changes. So Donald, uh, just to clarify, yeah. So let's say for for example, um, this file on the first of January, okay, is my face dot, uh, my face picture, and then I have my changes, okay. After my thirty days, um, what will happen is that I won't be able to access the particular version from the first of January. I won't be able to access that particular version. What will happen instead is that when the couple of days go by so let's say let's say the i'm in the start of march what will happen is that for those first couple of days whereby i can't get back to anymore 
what it'll do is it'll compress those patches and that initial baseline. It'll compress them to create a new baseline. So let's say on the 1st of February, what I'm seeing is a new face baseline. And then the patches, the new patches and new changes get added to that new baseline. So that's what's happening so that, you know, for the versioning um, window that you'd have and the rollback. And that's why you, you that's why we're unable to offer um, restores further back than the, the, the 30 days for Mosey Home. And that's just due to the way our back end is functioning. And that's due to the, the restrictions that we would have on a Mosey Home user's preferences in the back end. That's how the Mosey um, Home accounts are, 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 are managed. Um, that is, and now bear in mind that the 30 day versioning for Mosey Home will be extended in the coming months. Um, so you may have seen a couple of the blog articles about that. And on the news article, one of the news articles, uh, one of the newsletters, sorry, that was sent out, I believe, the month before last, had an article in that about the changing of those versionings, where it will be extending those so that you go. I think, I do believe, don't quote me on this, but I think Mosey Home is going from 30 days to 90 days versioning. So you'll be able to access files 90 days back. I hope that explains it for you, Donald. Yes, correct. Exactly, Eric. You probably <laughs> um so is it that you is it that you can back up just the changes because the application saves the files that way so you can find the incremental parts of the file in the local drive? I think that's yeah, so pretty much exactly. So what we're just doing is we're taking out the the um we're saving out the the parts of the file that have changed and we're just we're just matching that up with the with the areas that have been identified as changing within from the from the original um document. Apologies if I if I if I drag that answer out a long way, Eric. Um, I do apologize for that. No problem, Donald. So we have about five minutes left. Um, if there are any other questions, please just do pop them in. Um, and if you don't have any other questions, then. You know, thank you for taking the time. I do appreciate it. I know it's out of your your day, uh, and I I do very much appreciate you taking the time to join us. I hope the webinar was some way informal, informative, um, even if it was very informative, down to just a small bit informative, even if it just maybe gave you a different idea of some of the stuff we do. Then that's great. And um, if you do have any uh, feedback or you want to see anything in particular in a webinar please do let me know. You should have my email address from when the um, the invitations went out. If not, um, I will be probably either tomorrow or Friday. Once the recording is hosted on our servers, um, I will be sending out the link. You can reply back to me on that. If you have any suggestions for different types of webinars, then I would be grateful for that too. Um, Brian, thank you very much. Um, I I'm I'm no Picasso, but I do try my best with some of my drawings. <laughs> PowerPoint is uh, is not very forgiving. <laughs> so again, thank you very much for everybody for taking the time to join, um, and we will hope to see you um, next month. So we will be looking to run our webinar. It will go out in the newsletter, so I will hope to either run it. I would potentially hope to run it the week of Christmas, um, rather than the last. Wednesday of the month next month um, and that would just be because of the the holiday period the Christmas period whatever um, okay so I will leave it open there for another minute or two uh, to see if there's any other questions and again uh, thank you for joining today uh, and have a great rest of your day wherever you may be <laughs>